and today's point of discussion is about infrazygomatic bone screws and Damon appliance for non extraction correction of class 2 division 1 malocclusion clinical perspectives and biomechanical considerations so as we go uh, like every time uh, we'll go directly to one of the cases uh, so that we can discuss in details about how to go about with such clinical situations so this is a patient uh, uh, age uh, 22 years female uh, who reported with a chief complaint of forwardly placed upper front teeth and gaps in teeth uh, she did not have any relevant medical history so like we do with any other cases uh, we took all the records uh, the, the case record shows that uh, the dental midline was not on in this patient although the skeletal midline was perfect so the dental midline upper dental midline was shifted to the right uh, the smile aesthetics uh, was not good at all, which shows that uh, she had proclined incisors uh, with a midline diastema. Uh, apart from that, uh, uh, she had she complained of teeth uh, really sticking out uh, and the front teeth uh, not looking aesthetic at all. So that's how she presented in a 45 degree view. She presented with proclined incisors, facing, and a very unesthetic smile. She also revealed convexity of facial profile. So when we went ahead with the uh, intraoral view, we noticed uh, that uh, she had alignment issues both in the upper as well as in the lower anteriors. She had increased overjet. She had a class two division one malocclusion with half cusp class two relationship. She also presented with a midline diastema and a hundred percent deep bite, which was uh, traumatic. The occlusal uh, view uh, shows that uh, she had proclined incisors, midline diastema, and a deep overbite. The lower anteriors uh, uh, showed that there was a crowding of five millimeters uh, in the lower arch, apart from them uh, being a bit retroclined, but the crowding was quite severe. So uh, as a part of the pre-treatment radiographs taken, OPG was taken, uh, we showed that the upper third molars were missing, uh, which means that uh, she did not have full complement of teeth in the upper arch. So it's a very favorable situation for upper arch distalization when the third molars are missing. You can avoid a premolar extraction when you are treating a class two division one uh, case and third molars are missing with the incorporation of infrazygomatic bone screws in your practice. She also had mesoangularly impacted lower third molars. Uh, uh, which uh, requires to be extracted just for a prophylactic purpose. But if you go through this article on the efficacy of uh, molar distalization associated with second and third molar reaction states, it would clearly state that uh, when third molars are missing, it gives a very, very favorable instance of uh, molar distalization. It becomes much more easier. So when you treat a class two division one malocclusion uh, with third molar uh, missing, uh, you we could correlate it to any one of the any one of the clinical findings uh, which shows that uh, if the third molar is missing congenitally missing the second instance could be uh, where the third molar is impacted but it is below the cemento enamel junction of the second molar or the third molar could be in occlusion if the third molar is not uh, erupted uh, or uh, it's congenitally missing uh, avoid a premolar extraction when you are treating a class 2 division 1 case. You could avoid two treat extraction and it is always favorable to treat patients and the patient would always love it. Uh, if you have a third molar uh, which is either uh, below the cement NML junction of the second molar or in occlusion, then extraction becomes the only option for distalization. So this is a unique case in which the upper third molar was missing and therefore it's a class 2 division 1 and we can do away with a contemporary uh, uh, two premolar extraction. So we want to go into details of uh, the, what is the correlation with uh, class two division one case and third molar uh, impactions. You can go through this article written by us, or you can go through the previously quoted article uh, uh, at the which came out in the Angle Authorant. So uh, the, the regular cephalometry was taken, which shows that there is an increased overjet. The composite analysis was done. 
So it shows that there is deep bite, convexity of profile, and increased overjet. So the tracing was also done, and when we superimposed it over the uh, over the photographs, it showed uh, that the views uh, contemplated the clinical findings. So when superimposition uh, was done uh, and the lateral cephalometric values were brought out, we noted that the NB was two degrees, which means that it's a class one skeletal base. Uh, she had an IMP of 97, which shows the lower incisors are a bit proclined, but the upper incisors were seriously proclined, very severe. Uh, the FMA shows 17 degrees, which shows that she has a horizontal growth pattern, which makes her a favorable case for upper arch distalization. The nasal labial angle was obtuse, but that is due to a tipped up nose. Uh, lip incompetency was there. So uh, to conclude from the cephalometric parameters, we find that it's a class one skeletal base, a horizontal growth pattern, a camouflage of, uh, of class two division one malocclusion, which needs to be done. The skeletal parameters, however, are normal. So you want to plan out uh, the such form of treatment. You can go through this article uh, by Almeida. Uh, on the biomechanics of extra regular mini implants. We go through this uh, article, we will find uh, the various ways where uh, infrazygomatic bone screws uh, can be uh, used for detraction and distalization of upper arch, uh, considering the level of, uh, you know, the correlation of the hook with respect to the force application with, uh, from the infrazygomatic bone screw. So in this situation, we are looking at something of a middle parameter, which shows that uh, the the core, there will not be any uh, vertical trajectory of force. It's more of a simple distalization process that we would carry on in this case. Apart from that, we need to do a little bit of proximal stripping in the lower arch because there is quite a, a lot of uh, crowding in the lower. We could opt with a, uh, with a single incisor extraction also, but here in this case, we went ahead with a much more conservative approach of uh, proximal stripping in the lower anteriors. So basically, what do you want to do? It's basically a non-extraction case. It's leveling and alignment of the upper and the lower arch and maxillary arch distalization and proximal stripping in the lower arch and alignment. So what is the appliance system that we are go going to use? Uh, we are going to use the variable torque daemon appliance, uh, which is a semi-customized appliance. Uh, what is the uh, advantage of daemon appliance uh, uh, in these cases is that uh, it comes with a lot of options. Uh, so it, uh, the main option that it comes along with is the torque values. So it could come with a high torque, low torque, and a standard torque. So you can mix and match uh, uh, a case which is you are treating non-extraction and take advantage of the torque prescription of the daemon appliance. However, when you are using an MBT system in such cases, the problem what happens is that you have a specific torque value and you have to go ahead and treat every other case with the same torque option. So when you have an appliance system and you are, in, you are treating it non-extraction with the use of distalization and some amount of arch expansion, it's good to use uh, the passive self ligation appliance from Damon, uh, uh, which has a variable torque option. So what is the appliance prescription? Uh, in the upper arch, we are planning to use the uh, formula uh, high torque bracket. Uh, so what is the advantage of high torque is that uh, in these situations, you require a bit of overjet because you want to do a Distalization and uh, there is initial deficiency of overjet due to natural compensation, which happens in a class two division one, uh, the malocclusion. So in this case, you find that uh, it is 22 degree uh, torque in the central incisors and 13 degree in the lateral incisors. So what is the advantage is that uh, the adequate torque, which is available in the high torque system, you have advantage of distalization in maxillary arch because you are able to get get adequate overjet due to increased torque values. So in the mandibular arch, uh, we can use the standard torque. We don't want to use the high torque. Uh, we want to use the standard torque so that you don't uh, allow too much of flaring of the lower incisors. So you want to do a decrowding by a little bit of proximal stripping and maintaining the lower incisors in the right place. So therefore, uh, you can use the variable torque option of having a high torque in the upper and the standard torque in the lower. So the standard torque options in the lower shows that is minus three uh, for the central and the lateral incisors. 
So what is the wire sequencing which we are planning to use? In this case, we are planning to use 016 NITI for an initial 45 days in the upper hours, then followed by a 018 SS, then 1925 NITI for about 60 days, and then go ahead with the 1925 SS, which is our working archway. The working archway uh, of 1925 SS is a postable, uh, posted archway with a crimpable hook. And you can supply it uh, with a 1490 after you have uh, got the right occlusion in place. So the lower arch was basically leveling, alignment, and closure of space, which is created due to uh, proximal stripping and to correct the deep overbite, which is present by mild proclination of the incisors. That's our objective of the treatment. So uh, these bone screws are new uh, uh, to most of the clinicians nowadays. We have been extensively using it. So it is usually uh, uh, placed extra alveolarly, uh, which means uh, that they are placed away from the dentition, not interdentally like the micro implant. Uh, you have the loose technique where you place the bone screw uh, lateral to the uh, six and the lens technique where you place the screw uh, lateral to the seven. Uh, uh, you can choose any one of the techniques we prefer the lens technique. So it's the IZC bone screws, they're extra alveolar in placement. Uh, they don't interfere with the distalization in any way uh, because they are not interdentally placed. And they are one of the most safest uh, to use as they are placed in the safe, safe zone in good B1 quality of bone, which is present in the infrazygomatic quest. You can go through this article written by us to know more about IZC and BS. So what, uh, how is it placed basically? Uh, the, the bone screws are initially placed, uh, uh, we use the bioray, uh, and uh, you can initially uh, go in horizontally, uh, and then after you have created a punch hole with the uh, bone screw itself, you have to uh, move the, uh, the driver by about 45 to 70 degree downward, and then uh, go straight up into the infrazygomatic press. Uh, that's a unique way, and you need to mastered the art of placing a infrazygmatic bone screw. If you want to know more about it, the master uh, uh, John Lynn has put up his textbook on creative orthodontics and blending the daemon system with tabs to manage difficult malocclusion, where he gives extensively uh, about the details of how and where bone screws needs to be placed. So how did the treatment progress? Uh, so what is the biomechanics that we are going through? As you can see in this uh, the case, we are planning to place a bone screw, uh, infrazygmatic one, uh, two into 14 millimeters stainless steel uh, one from Biore. Uh, we are planning to uh, place uh, uh, ACOS wire uh, that is accentuated curve was P, and the working arch wire uh, is 1925 stainless steel that helps in preventing the anteriors uh, uh, to extrude. Uh, that's the uh, use of ACOS. So the amount uh, you can use a e-chain or a coil spring to give about 300 to 350 grams of force uh, uh, unilaterally for distalization of the maxillary arch since you need to displace all the teeth together. That's the amount of force that is required. And this force when you give uh, cause a clockwise rotation. Uh, a clockwise rotation which causes uh, an intrusive component in the, uh, in the, in the posterior segment uh, and an extrusive component in the anterior segment. However, this ACOS wire helps uh, to counteract the anterior extrusive effect. So that's uh, what uh, we need to prevent. So the net effect that we get out of this uh, whole system is that it causes distalization and occlusal plane control, uh, which is mildly intrusive in nature. So that's the uniqueness of using a ACOS along with a uh, infrazygomatic bone screw. Otherwise you could end up with dumping of the incisor. We want to go more into details uh, of how to control occlusal plane with ACOS. Uh, you can go through this uh, uh, edition uh, of AO Animal Session from by Chiolo Pike. So how did this treatment progress? Uh, we went ahead with bonding of the upper arch as there was adequate overjet and we want to use this overjet for, uh, to go ahead with distalization. The bonding of the lower arch was done a bit later. Uh, so after alignment, you could see that it is an end-on relationship and we are distalizing uh, it with the bone screw space. Uh, so it gives uh, uh, the net effect is distalization and a mild uh, intrusive in the anteriors as well as in the posteriors. So that's the upper arch is, uh, distalization that goes ahead uh, with the bone screws uh, in place. 
Now, uh, the treatment progressed, and we started bonding up the lower arch and created space uh, by proximal stripping. But we need to understand that uh, the central photograph shows that uh, the can, there should not be uh, any can developing because you are giving a bilateral force. So even if you are using, if you want unilateral displacement, it is better to use a bone screw on either side and give light forces on the side where you don't want uh, too much amount of displacement just to maintain the occlusal cant. So you don't want occlusal canting happening. So this is uh, in progress. Uh, so you uh, you find that the upper arch distalization is in progress, and what do we need to do uh, in the in the lower arch is that basically we need to do a bit of proximal stripping. Uh, so how much amount of proximal stripping was done? That's about 2.5 millimeters was done because that was the amount of Bolton excess that was there uh, in the anterior segment. So that was enough for decrowding of the uh, anteriors, apart from a little bit of flaring. And uh, the overjet was adequate uh, to displace the upper arch uh, and retract and get a normal overjet and overbite. So this is uh, uh, the second stage uh, of the treatment in which the occlusal pl plane is still being maintained and the displacement is still in progress. And uh, we are now coming close to getting a class one molar and a canine relationship. So that's uh, how it is in progress. So this is the final stage in which we are settling down. That's uh, the, with a thinner wire and uh, closing up minor spaces here and there, whichever is there. Uh, the, by this time, you should have already got a class one molar and a canine relationship. And the midline should be perfectly on in order to get a perfect smile at the end of the day. So uh, that's the end result. It's a class one molar and a canine relationship and a good seating occlusion that we achieved. On the left hand side also is a class one molar and a canine and a beautifully seated occlusion. The midlines are perfectly on. Uh, as you can see in this case, the overward bite, which was uh, seriously traumatic to start with, has completely gone. Uh, and the overjet is also normal. And the midline diastema is obviously uh, completely taken care of. So that's the result uh, on the occlusal perspective. We put a bonded lingual retainer both in the upper and the lower after closure of the anterior spaces and correction of the procrination, uh, as you see here. And then uh, decrowding of the lower anteriors were also done. Uh, this was achieved by proximal stripping and a bit of flaring of the lower incisors. So what did we achieve at the end of the day? We achieved a, a perfect midline and a good amount of lip, in, uh, lip competency, a very relaxed uh, lip uh, with no puckering in the mentolibial uh, sulcus region, which shows that adequate retraction has, has been done, non-extraction without premolar extraction, just by distalization of the upper arch. And this is a beautiful smile that we got at the end of the day. The smile is sitting and the patient was really satisfied. As you can see that the midlines are uh, beautifully coordinated and the smile looks really aesthetic. The 45 degree uh, the view uh, also shows that the smile aesthetics has grossly improved at the end of the treatment. And the profile shows that it's now an orthogonal facial profile and a balanced lip posture that is attained at the end of the treatment. So this is the radiograph, uh, uh, which, is, which shows that a uh, good amount of distalization is done, no root resorption. Uh, when we gave uh, about uh, 300 to 350 grams of force, uh, which were dissipated among all the, uh, all the 14 teeth in the upper arch. Uh, the, a prophylactic extraction of 38 and 48, although they were asymptomatic, was advised in order to prevent uh, crowding in the lower anteriors, if at all they happen due to them. The cephalometric parameters shows that uh, the overjet was uh, beautifully taken care of. Now there is a normal overjet and overbite, a balanced facial profile, and there is no lip strain. Uh, the lower incisors did, did procline mildly. So that's the composite analysis. That's the tracing. Uh, and this is the superimposition on the photograph, uh, which shows that good balance of facial contours have been achieved at the end of the treatment. So this is the superimposition on the face and the cephalometric breathing shows that the NB angle is one degree, which shows that uh, the class one skeletal base was maintained. Uh, the upper incisors grossly improved. Uh, a good amount of retraction was achieved at the end of the treatment uh, uh, and maybe 16, 17 degrees uh, of improvement. Uh, the IMPA shows that there's mild proclination, which happened during for decrowding of the lower anteriors. The FMA uh, shows uh, uh, 19 degrees, which is still horizontal, but it has improved. Uh, that's because of distalization of the maxillary segment. Uh, 
and obviously distillation helps in opening up the mandibular plane angle uh, a bit. So uh, it's still a horizontal growth pattern and good camouflage of class two uh, division one uh, malocclusion was achieved. So how did the treatment progress? Uh, so that's how it progressed. Uh, how did we correct the 100% deep bite and the traumatic bite and the crow uh, crowding in the lower and the spacing in the anteriors? So uh, we bonded up with the daemon appliance and started distalizing. Uh, then uh, bonded up the lower arch, did decrowding with proximal stripping and a little bit of flaring. And then uh, settled the occlusion. Finally, uh, we got a beautiful result in which we closed up the upper spaces, the corrected the overjet, non-extraction and uh, decrowding of the lower incisors and a perfect midline at the end of the day. So uh, how did the occlusion uh, change over time? It's end on to start with. A good distalization uh, was done, then decrowding of the lower incisors, distalization in progress, uh, settling of the occlusion, and we achieved a class one molar and a class one canine with ideal overjet and overbite at the end of the treatment. So let's compare the facial changes that we achieved during the course of the treatment. So initially she started with spacing and an incompetent lip and incisors visible uh, at rest. Uh, now her face is quite balanced. So lip incompetency at rest was taken care of. This was a smile initially and she ended up with a beautiful smile with midlines perfectly on, closure of spaces, overjet overbite taken care of and a, and a very consonant smile arc uh, which it, uh, was achieved and the midline considerations was also taken care of. So this is how she started a 45 degree view. Uh, this shows a good amount of uh, smile aesthetic changes, uh, the, which was uh, uh, a hallmark of the part of the treatment. So she started with a mild convex profile. Uh, we didn't extract, but we displaced and got a straight profile at the end of the treatment. So the convexity of the profile was also taken care of and lip competency definitely improved during the course of the treatment. So pre and post treatment uh, changes show that initially she started with a huge interincisal angle, uh, traumatic bite and uh, increased overjet of about seven millimeters. Uh, ended up uh, with perfect overjet and overbite. Uh, the marked improvement in the interincisal angle was achieved. So the full arch distillation did justice uh, to, the, uh, to the treatment and to the face uh, and the facial changes that were achieved. So the superimposition was done, uh, which showed uh, the, what the parameters uh, changed during the course of the treatment. And these were the parameters which changed. Retraction of the upper incisors and a mild intrusion uh, was achieved. Uh, the full arch displaization of the upper arch, as you can see that the displaization uh, significantly happened, maybe three, four millimeters of displaization of the whole arch happened. Uh, clockwise rotation of the occlusal plane happened due to the use of bone screws and mild flaring of the lower incisors in order to correct the overjet, in the overjet as well as the deep overbite. So if you want to go more into details of infrazygomatic bone screws, you can go through this article written by us in the Journal of Indian Orthodontic Society uh, in the 50th edition. Uh, that would give you a complete overview about bone screws and the future prospects of it, which looks very, very bright. We always pass on a message during, uh, during our, uh, our videos. Uh, this is the recent trend uh, uh, and the recent point of discussion in social media to fight nepotism and nurture talent because all we know is that your juniors are the future of your profession and you need to support them uh, and teach them the right things uh, so that your profession can prosper over years and years. Thank you so much for a patient listening.